Now, in verse 53, Jesus' words were very plain and clear. In verse 51, he plainly claims to be the living bread and that his followers must eat. That his followers must eat. He also says with absolute certainty that the bread which I shall give is my flesh. We'll, de dive, we'll take a deep dive into these verses a bit more in the upcoming slides. Now, when the Jews are asking him this question, the believing Jews, mind you, believing Jews, not his enemies. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? In verse 52, Jesus further doubles down even more, emphatically saying, truly, truly, I say unto you, amen, amen, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. Now, I'll come to that point. I've talked about this contrast about John 4.32. I have no food to eat of which you do not know. And Jesus was clearing that up for them, saying that I have not been literal bread. I'm talking, uh, I'm talking about the will of him who sent me. That's the food I eat. Also, the example of the leaven, or say the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which has actually got to do with their false doctrines and their teachings not to eat or follow it. In these cases, he was saying it is metaphorical, just to clear their view if it was literal. But he doesn't do that over here. Now, let's look at the language. Now, if I'm looking at the language used by John in the Greek, it's even far more disturbing. Yeah, this is a very gruesome photo I've kept here. Sorry if it just repulsed some of you, but this is what the Jews were thinking, mind you. Now, in John verses 650 to verse 653, the Greek word favo is used to denote the term eating. Excuse my pronunciations, I'm not a native Greek speaker. Okay. However, after the Jews begin to express ridicule, incredulity at this idea of eating Christ's flesh, the language begins to intensify. The language in the New Testament, John begins to use the word trogo, trogon, trogon instead of fago. Now, trogo is a decidedly more graphic term meaning to chew on or to gnaw on, as when an animal is ripping apart its prey, like this. And the Jews were absolutely disgusted with this because for them, if you are reading the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus, it's mentioned that Jews cannot eat raw meat or raw flesh. They have to drain the blood, and this is not something which they can do. They can't eat an animal which also dies because of, say, natural causes and things like that, or it is killed by another animal. They just can't do that. And also, like, say, cannibalism. This was like, of course, the Jews took it in a very cross cardinalistic understanding of it, so they thought that we are actually going to eat this man alive kind of things right there. And that's why they were disgusted. And uh, I could just show you that Fargo and Trago, what's the difference right here? I've just got the concordance ready here. And we'll just drop the link here in the description box. The video, sorry, where's my video gone? So this is for the word Fago. I don't know how to pronounce it. Native Greek speakers, please correct me here. Forgive my butchery. And this is the other one. And if I will just uh, increase the size here. Original word Fago. Fago, I eat, eat, partake of food, met, I devour or consume, as Rast does only. So this is what word Jesus used in John 650 to, 5th, to 653. So if I will come here on the intermedia. Fago. 
I'll just drop the interlinear, the link to the interlinear as well. Uh, Rakesh, uh, we could just stay on topic for a while. That's another topic to discuss. I just want to get digress because Daniel 927 actually can apply to a lot of other things. It's not necessarily this. I'll, I can talk about that in another upcoming video. It's got more to do with the second, with the, the fall of the second temple. Okay, where was I? So there is Fago. Just a second. If I can, if I can. It, it, Fago. It. So you can see all the other places it's given a primary verb to eat. And then you have Chogon. Here it says to eat or to partake of a meal. But if I click on that link and I want it to go to its occurrences in the Strong Creeks concordance, then it clearly tells me to gnaw, to munch, or to crunch. It's more, by definition, this is a more of a more gruesome word. It's a more stronger word. So we actually gnaw on the Eucharist. We munch it, we crunch it. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's what got his followers here very much revolted. Okay. And I also talked about the places where he was, say, being... I did, sure, I did put up my slide over here about those passages. Yeah, so these are the examples where a figurative reading of these verses. I'll just increase the size for your convenience, guys. Does not work. So why did the Hebrews think that Jesus... Uh, uh, why did the Hebrews not take Jesus figuratively? Because if they had taken Jesus figuratively, they would mean that they'll have to um, slander Jesus, beat him up, and these kind of things to get eternal life. That's not that's not what Jesus meant. So they had to take him literally. Uh, Psalm two one to three, Isaiah nine eighteen to twenty, Isaiah forty nine twenty six, Micah three three, Revelation seven six to sixteen. Now, for Jesus' hearers, in the figurative sense, Jesus would have been promising eternal life for those who persecute him, assault him, slander him, kill him. Okay? I think I have it open here. If I don't, I'll just put that in. Psalm 2, 1 to 3. Hold on. Isaiah forty nine twenty six. Let me cut three three. Revelation. Uh, is it seventeen? It's going by memory. I'll just go through a few of them, so you'll just get the picture. Hey, God bless you, Catholic Crusader. Good to see you. Just a second, guys. I think I've gone off this verse. I've made a typo in my slides. Sorry, it was Psalm 27, 1 to 3. My, my part. Just increase the size here. Here you go. It's Psalm 27, 1 to 3. I'll just drop this, these verses out here so you guys can take a note. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Now, this verse, verse 2 is the most important one when the wicked even my enemies and my foes come upon me to eat up my flesh they stumbled and fell 
Now here he's talking about enemies to eat his flesh, to kill them, to destroy them, to persecute them. So this is what the Jews understand from the Old Testament context. This is what eating my flesh and for say drinking my blood would mean through a figurative sense. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I'll be confident. So just to know this context when I'm persecuted. Let's go to the next passage, Isaiah 9, 18 to 20. For wickedness burns as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest, and they shall mount up like lifting up of smoke. Though the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire, no man shall spare his brother. And he shall snatch on his right hand and be hungry, and he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Again, this kind of means murder, slander. It's, this guy likes to use the King James. I'll just switch to the new King James just so that it makes a bit more sense to people, most people. New King James. Come on, load up. For wickedness burns as the fire, it shall, oh, sorry, devour the briars and the thorns and kindle and the thickets in the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. Though the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother, so people are just going to fight against themselves, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, they'll steal. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. That's like saying in this context that they're just going to rob each other, kill each other, because Isaiah is just talking about some kind of an impending doom, some prophecy coming upon the people of Israel. Isaiah 49, 26. I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh. There you go. And they shall be drunk with their blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of God. So what does this mean? I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh. And they shall be drunk with their blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that all people shall know that I, the Lord, am I'm your savior. So this is what it is about. It's talking about, again, it's talking about persecution. I'll feed the people who oppress you with their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood. So there you go, as with sweet wine. This is, again, a figurative thing. And the Jews could not take this figuratively because this was very harsh language. The language is even more harsh if they took it figuratively, in a sense, in a sense. And now he's talking about the symbolic Babylon in Revelation. This is again John, by the way, because John is the author of Revelation. Hey, Chagon Deneris, good to see you. God bless you. I saw the woman drunk with blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. He's talking about the symbolic final Babylon in Revelation. And here you can see, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. All those people who have been persecuted, been killed, murdered, martyred for the name of Jesus. And that's what it means. If So Jesus, if he was being figurative or metaphorical that you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood the Jews to the Jews would have taken the task so do we need to kill you do we need to persecute you so that reading in the first century Jewish context just does not hold and if I just read on I don't want to say anything more but this is what it is. There you go again. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot, that is this prostitute, Babylon sits, this whore, are people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. So she sits over all of them. 
and the ten horns which you saw on the beast, they will hate this whore. This is the language, mind you, used in the Bible. Make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. This is what it means. Eat her flesh, burn her with fire, destroy her. So this is again a Jewish idiom and it's used by John, the same author. But in that case, Jesus was not being idiomatic in John 6. He was being very clear and he was being quite literal in a literal but in a supernatural sense. Okay. All right. Just skip over a bit. Done with this. Now, this is where things actually get a bit more serious because in verse 61, it's not just the Jewish crowd, that is the multitude, it's not the people who had witnessed this miracle, the people who wanted to get healed, but Jesus' own disciples. This is not just the 12 apostles, but the disciples who were with him right from the beginning, a lot of them, they were getting scandalized by this. Now, if Jesus was symbol being symbolic, sorry, typo over here, he would clear up the difficulty now among his disciples, which he did so in the past. Or rather, you could say in other passages, if it not necessarily happened in the past, like say John 4, 32 to 34, when he's saying that I have bread which you do not know of, which is to do the will of the Father. Here he's saying it's actually Matthew 16, 5 to 17, to beware of the east of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, or the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And when the disciples were thinking literally, he cleared it up, saying that... Uh, it's, it's the teaching, the doctrines which they teach, beware of that. But in this case, he does not uh, clarify. Instead, he again doubles down, he triples down, saying, are you offended at this? Now, this time he's talking to his own disciples, the ones closest to him, not just the crowd who has wit witnessed his miracles, that if you are to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before. Now, be very careful. In verse... Uh, 62 he's talking about if you see the son of man ascending where he was before was jesus being lit was jesus being symbolic about his ascension of course not a lot of his followers did see his ascension post the resurrection and he was being literal over here so if we apply that to the context of the next verse sorry i'll have to exit the slideshow sean six come here all the way to john 61 just read these three when jesus knew him knew in himself that his disciples again jesus is god he is omniscient he is all-knowing that his disciples murmured at it were complaining about it he said unto them does this offend you are you guys offended too with this my closest people what and if he shall see the son of man ascend up where he was before will that offend you too if you see me ascend up to where I was before. And we know this thing happened literally. And then he says, it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, this is a third objection, saying that Jesus clears up, saying that uh, he is not being this. He is being metaphorical. He's not talking about his flesh. He's talking about the stuff in a spiritual sense. But this has a twofold meaning, and if you examine the the context, the immediate context in the verse, previous two verses before that, he is being literal here because we can't say that this ascension was symbolic, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses will talk about some kind of a spiritual resurrection and some kind of a symbolic quote unquote ascension, not a literal one, which is heretical. This is heresy.